how are you doing today, Quinn? Hello, Daniel. I'm doing I'm doing fantastic. I'm it's, excited it's, to be here. Well, yeah. I'm excited to speak with you. My goodness, I loved your paper so much. It was freaking amazing. So really well done. Your presentation was glorious. I really, really appreciated okay. the line of thought that you brought to it. So just just outstanding work, Quinn. Thank thank you, man. I, pre I appreciate that a lot. And yeah, I just uh just finished the uh absolute choice, man. It was, it was awesome. Well, yeah. Well, thank you, Gwen. I I'm slowly making my way through the whole anthology. I think I'm about like halfway through. Still, still like three or four papers to go. But it's a, it's it's such a unique experiment. Yeah, it was really an honor to participate in that. Well, I I really um enjoyed it, and I think with the anthology, which was very very neat. Um, I think there's increasingly a movement of people who um, are starting to think of philosophy in terms of expanding beyond just merely say, oh, how do we become, say, a Hegel specialist? Because who in the world can be a Hegel specialist? You know, what does it even mean? Um, and likewise, to be thinking, OK, hey, you know, how does Hegel potentially help us um, in the realm of like mathematics, as Medieval would talk about, or in Tantra and Sutra and, or, or different things? Um, I'm a strong believer that actually a lot of these philosophers, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't believe Hegel wrote his book saying, man, one day people are going to get a dissertation in me. That's so great. Or that Aquinas put down the Summa Theologica because he's like, oh, entire departments will be devoted to it. Um, no, they wrote these things because they believed, I think Schopenhauer put it very well, where it was the function as a kind of ladder that people could climb up toward truth, beauty and goodness, like something higher. Now, what exactly is that? One has to discuss. But um, I, I, I reference it all the time. But Schopenhauer, where he says, you know, modern education today is like a man who comes up to a ladder, pulls the rungs off the ladder and throws them in a bag to carry around. He doesn't use the ladder to climb anymore, just to collect the rungs to show them all. Um, and I think you see increasingly people there was one, a reaction to the university or philosophy or all these di different thoughts that was a sort of like, oh, this is a waste of time. It's impractical and it doesn't matter. So you had like the the most important thing in the world is to, you know, attend college. Then you had a reaction of, no, the humanities and thinking doesn't matter. And now there's a kind of, I think, reapproach where people are going, well, maybe this stuff matters. It's just how we approached it that was wrong. Maybe instead of pulling the rungs off the ladder and collecting them, we need to ex inst instead look at how to climb the ladder, how to use these thinkers in different ways. And for me, the anthology sort of functions, and then I'll give it to you, kind of as a um, speaking to that, I think, that new horizon of thought. And I find it encouraging, too, because you see with all these different groups forming online, rather it'd be like Tim Adlin's Voicecraft or the Philosophy Portal, and I can keep going, of people who are generally hungry for higher thinking outside of a university setting because there's a sense in which it's really important. Maybe we're still kind of groping around trying to figure out why it's really, really important. But I think the meaning crisis that Verveke talks about, all of that stuff kind of speaks to why it is important. And you have people groping around trying to figure it out. And I think the anthology is a testament to people who are part of that effort, which to me gives me hope. I mean, we can always turn on the news and find a million ways to describe why we're all going to die tomorrow or whatever. Um, but the fact that you have people that are doing this by their own volition, by their own will, who want to take on these texts and see how things relate, I, I find as uh, encouraging, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel, I feel that hunger is a good sort of existential mode to describe at least how I'm relating to this space. And I feel like what brought me here was, you know, I, I did undergrad university and found it uh, found it missing or lacking and and very, you know, and, and sort of very existentially uh, poignant ways. And so I was always longing for something else. And and it's funny, initially, I really got interested in John Verveke and listened to his lecture series and the meaning crisis. And there was something very exciting about sort of taking that diagnostic perspective and saying, okay, you know, it's not just me suffering and sort of existential isolation. There's something larger right. going on here. And it's, I think it can be very, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it can be meaningful to get a kind of a little bit of a grip on, you know, the ways in which we're suffering, but then the, you know, the immediate, um, kind of response to that is sort of how to actually then engage in meaning making endeavors again you know you can only sort of uh 
consume so much or, or diagnose so much to, you know, to, to the extent, you know, to which then there's naturally a, a, a you know, a desire to respond and engage in a more um, participatory way. And I feel that the, yeah, the anthology, Cadell's courses, all of these communities that are popping up for, for me is, yeah, I, I guess it's just so it is it feels like a an important next step in my own personal becoming and, and seems characteristic of, of many other folks participating in this online space. You know, it's, you know, um, I'm reading through Bard's second book now in the Futuristic Trilogy, you know, and I'm talking about just the interactive nature of the digital media. Um, and it feels, yeah, it feels, it feels like this is the, you know, it, it feels like it is truly attempting to be something interactive, which is very different than the broadcast sort of traditional structure of the academia. Um, totally, just totally different in structure. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's messy and we're, and people are, we're playing in this space and who knows how it will turn out, but yeah, mad respect to, to you and Cadell for kind of spearheading, um, what feels like an attempt to, uh, yeah, live within this new structure, you know, mm -hmm. within, within this new structure of media. So, well, uh, first off, it's it's only possible with people such as yourself being part of it. So, thank you. Uh, second, I salute Cadell very much for putting together Philosophy Portal and putting all these different classes and different things. I have such a dare I say eclectic tendency to wake up and be wanting to write one morning on economics, another morning on sociology, and the next day, like I got really taken up with some of the uh, McCormick, uh, No Country for Old Man, thinking about it through a Philip Reef lens. Uh, the ability to stick on, say Nietzsche for for six weeks or stick on Hegel for six weeks and really drill it in. I salute uh, Dr. Last uh, for that. And I think it, I think it's wonderful. Um, I really like, I believe, book to, uh, The Global Empire. He has a part where he talks about mobilization, eternalism, I really like, and how there's a real sense of which as we move into a more interactive sort of um, cultural paradigm, there's more of a coming to terms with um, mobilism versus eternalism and how there's this constant change, this constant becoming a different thing, which of course is existentially overwhelming, right? Because one of the reasons we tend toward um, eternalism or what someone like a Philip Reef will call Gibbons, you know, like in math, they'll talk about Gibbons, the sort of solace, is because it is existentially and psychologically quite um, difficult to have this notion of new information just when you think you've, you know, settled upon something, just when you think you know it, it, it sort of um, changes. Um, one of the things that has been happening uh, that I think has generated the meaning crisis um, that Viveki will talk about is this melting away of givens or things that people can sort of have to stabilize their identity before the widespread um, ex internet. You know, yes, the internet's been around for a long time, but really, honestly, for the average person to have higher speed internet, to be able to load videos, to do Zim calls, that's actually... I would dare say three years old. It's not old where average people, not just like urban areas, cities or whatever, could kind of access. I live on a farm and this internet that we have here, this, this is three, four years, very, very new uh, that you're able to have this level of internet where you're able to communicate and different things. So I think that's very new. And before you had that interconnectivity, if you sort of felt like uh, there's something missing from life, there's something lacking, you felt very alone with it uh, because, you know, it wasn't as likely that you would maybe interact with someone online or other people who sort of understood that. You may you may go to college, you know, just because you're at college doesn't mean you run into people that sense that lack because they might be all in on the neoliberal structure of education or the global capitalist structure of education where it's about getting a job and sort of moving up the ladder. And none of that is inherently bad. It depends. Everything is bad in the wrong order or with the wrong level of hold. And, you know, so it just depends. Um, but what's now happened uh, is with the internet and the ability to connect, one is able to find people to say, oh, I'm not crazy. There are other people who have a sense of this and who are working on the problem and who understand certain issues. And I mean, honestly, you, one sees from the different, um, you know, there's two sides of the meaning crisis. There's meaning crisis as this kind of purely philosophical meaning crisis, but then there's also just the mental health crisis and these kind of get conflated together. There mm. is a kind of brute fact 
to the existence of the meaning crisis. Um, you know, I talk with Cadell and we've done our own works on trying to complexify the meaning crisis a little bit, um, where we always have to remember that we actually do know how to solve the meaning crisis right now. We all do. You go into nationalism, racism, close mindedness. You shut yourself off from other people. Uh, war. We all know of ways to solve the meaning crisis. Uh, human history is full of countless ways to solve the meaning crisis. Every civilization has had a quote unquote meaning crisis as they've had a food crisis, a water shelter shortage. It's just that we no longer accept the previous um, solutions for having meaning because we believe they contribute to war or violence or that they're immoral, basically. I think this is always important to realize because if we forget that, then we talk about the meaning crisis like some sort of alley we stumbled into and what the heck are we doing? How do we end up here? We're so stupid. Um, whereas I really think metaphorically, we have to understand the meaning crisis is more like the example I always make is Thomas More. You know, Thomas More in A uh, Man for All Seasons, he's the one who refused to, to grant King Louis a divorce. And so he went to jail and ultimately was executed because he wouldn't um, give the annulment to the king uh, during, you know, around the time of the English Civil War. Not quite there, but, uh, um, but in that period of time, Thomas More could have left prison at any point. He knew how to do it. All he had to do was give the annulment, you know, to, to the king and he would have, you know, he would have been free. But he believed it would, now rather he was right about this, is a different quote, but he believed it was immoral and wrong to do it. So he ultimately suffered for a higher principle, right? I think mm. it's just really important for us to see the meaning crisis as reflecting that. We do know how to escape it. In fact, millions of people are using those options. They're falling into fascism. They're falling into uh, nationalism and war and conflict. We had, a, you know, I think a good way to think of the whole invasion of Ukraine is a response to the meaning crisis in, return, in terms of going to an old solution, mainly nationalism, imperialism, and things like that. I think one has to, if you want to understand what's going on in Ukraine and you read Dugan and you read his, you know, his work on the, uh, your own Asianism and different things, it is absolutely his entire framing of what Russia is doing is in terms of stopping uh, global capitalism and the destruction of meaning that it brings. Well, it's a then it's a response to stopping the meaning crisis, right? Um, and basically, if we keep the danger of talking about the meaning crisis as something we stumbled into and we don't know what we're doing, which I feel sometimes is the metaphoric structure that comes through. The danger is you make someone like Dugan not sound crazy. Because if the West has unleashed some sort of virus of the meaning crisis and we have no idea what we're doing, well, then a strategy of separation of like dividing yourself from Europe and America is like containing the plague, basically. But if instead we understand the meaning crisis as um, pointing to higher values and something that speaks of a nobility, well, then, Dugan, you're cutting yourself off from an opportunity to be noble, far from Russia's advancement into Ukraine being some sort of noble undertaking to stop the West. It's the exact opposite. It's a refusal to submit yourself to the challenge of the meaning crisis and the call for higher values. And in fact, it's cowardly. So for me, it's really important to understand the meaning crisis in those terms, because then you can flip it on, say, a Dugan and Russian and different things like that, uh, where, where I guess what I'm saying is one of my critiques of some of the conversations of the meaning crisis is that it unfortunately metaphorically kind of justifies some of the ways that China and Russia and different are cutting themselves off from the West because we talk as if we've caught some sort of virus and we don't know what we're going to do and we're falling into mental illness. Well, then it makes a whole lot of sense to try to cut yourself out of the global community and the global state and different things like that. So, but all that aside, one of the other things is that if you've experienced this kind of lack of meaning in society, before the internet, you could feel alone. And a lot of sociologists like Peter Berger, um, Hunter, so on, uh, they'll talk about how beliefs are never individual. Like, you, you know, we like if everyone around us believes two plus two equals five, it's going to be really hard to believe two plus two equals four, even if we know better. Right. Because we start questioning ourselves. Like if you don't have that social support, it's really hard, even for something that, you know, quote unquote, is true, not to make you feel crazy. And, you know, that's like the ass conformity experiment and so on and so forth. And, you know, that, you know, you could get into I know the Stanford prison experiment has been under attack. Milligram, we all know the kind of problem with court. Well, what ends up happening now? is when you have the internet and you can encounter other people that sort of say, no, we need to go back to these philosophies. Something is lacking. You're not crazy. It actually then says, oh, we're supported. You start making these philosophy portal communities, intellectual dark webs and different things. And I think that's a really important step because then if those people are supported, the likelihood there is a network effect and they work together to answer the meaning crisis in a way that holds the high standards goes up. 
because those people feel supported. They don't feel crazy. And once you don't feel crazy, then you start to focus on the work. Like if you feel like you're crazy, you may not focus on the work, right? Because you don't even know if you should focus on the work because maybe you're a crazy person, right? But once you start meeting a community of people that accept the same premise you do, then it's easier to focus on the work. And then the possibility of arising to um, an address, maybe not a solution, but an address to the meaning crisis. Because the meaning, the problem of meaning is always there. It's not something you solve. It's something you manage. Um, and, and so you address it. Um, and, uh, and that's the other problem with calling it the meaning crisis. Like if I would have another critique, even though I use that language, you see, when you call it a crisis, it's like something you solve and you're done with. No, we exactly. need to talk about the meaning management, like the meaning prob, like the meaning, the meaning situation. Uh, I'll have to think about that. I've used the language of meaning crisis because, you know, it's very difficult to introduce new language and people know what you're talking about. But in, yeah, the, right, but yeah. in the book, Belonging Again, it, we talk about how meaning is a constant thing. Like there is always a problem of meaning you have to address in the same way that like if you talk about a food shortage, no one interprets that as meaning that you solve food and you're done with it forever, right? You always have to maintain the infrastructure to make food be there or else you're going to have starvation, right? We need to think about meaning that way where it's something you address uh, and we're, and the question is finding ways of addressing meaning without falling into, say, a Dugan solution or whatever, which the more and more you have the internet and people coming together that go, oh, I'm socially supported in this effort. Oh, I am not crazy. Then the higher the likelihood that you can have, and I'll give it back to you, a collective address, a collective sort of coming to terms with it. And look, like the work you do on saying, okay, there's a lot of good in Buddha. There's a lot of good in Eastern thought, but how do we bring it together with Hegel? You know, how many people without, the, it's kind of like, I guess what I'm saying it's very difficult to imagine people even having those ideas before the internet. Yes, it can happen. Yes, Schopenhauer read the Upanishads. Yes, there were people in the West exposed to the East. But really, I think it's quite clear that the likelihood of, say, um, really, really deeply diving into an intellectual tradition outside of your just wherever you're born into was much harder, much harder. I'm not saying it was impossible. You know, Bard talks about uh, Zoroastrianism in Germany and Nietzsche. Of course, there was exposure. But to have like thousands of people interacting and then to have the cross-pollination and kind of the creative thinking, because to, to have those ideas, there has to be a certain level of extreme diving into two different fields, like an extreme diving into day, an extreme diving into Easter thought. Well, that's where new ideas can arise. And thus the probability of figuring out ways to address the meaning crisis go up quite a lot. So I actually think when we think about it this way, if on, on, if we're sticking, you know, to, to reiterate this notion of kind of hope, again, it's very easy to sort of say, we're all going to die. But actually I do think there's reason to think that this, um, that, that, there, that there's reason to hope because you have people that are looking this thing. Like, if, like ideas are practically eyes. If you have a new ontological conception of human beings as not merely being beings, but also having a notion of becoming that takes seriously Eastern thought and doesn't have like a Deleuzian becoming that becomes what I call an essential difference, but a kind of the becoming that you talk about in your paper, that changes how we are as human beings to ourselves as ourselves and therefore changes how we're open to the other, what kind of thoughts we are to the other. And that seems to be really critical for the, the work that Mr. Barr talks about in the Futica trilogy and the openness to other people and, and the cross-pollination that could result from that. Amazing, Daniel, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's, so, there's so much there. Um, all right, yeah, the first, the first point that I find fascinating is this notion that meaning meaning is always is always something of a problem to us. And the framing of the whole meaning crisis, which I would happen to agree with you on this critique, is that it kind of, the framing of it presupposes a kind of final solution, if you will. You know, that it isn't always sort of already an existential problem, regardless of the historical moment. Um, and I noticed that a lot of, I think the rhetoric surrounding the, you know, the uh, solution to the meaning crisis is kind of negotiated often by a, you know, kind of a little bit of a regressive return to some pre-technological state or, or, you know, some historical state that was in a kind of organic harmony and didn't have some of the, you know, the ills of, of modern uh, late capitalistic life. Um, and, and, you know, maybe Dugan's response is kind of a bit of a regression in that sense. 
And then similarly, there's also the future projection of of a kind of of a kind of unity or a harmony or some sort of final resolution, right? And I think in my paper, I, I think I only mention it briefly, but seeing both of these as structured by a kind of A equals A logic, a kind of um, harmonious, self-symmetrical identity um, that, you know, that uh, that finds its resolution in the past or some sort of future projection, right? And sort of the, the opportunity or maybe the hope uh, if we could speak in those terms, like you're saying, to me seems to be something like the, you know, the the confrontation with otherness, making that like the difficult choice, as you say, the difficult absolute choice, which is incredibly existentially anxiety provoking, is to sort of acknowledge that this lack that we might be, you know, that we're kind of collectively starting to, I think, feel or wake up to is not something that will necessarily be solved or overcame, right? Um, and this is kind of a something that I've been thinking a lot about, and I just listened to the uh, Cadell talking with um, about the the Parallax Sangha. Yes. Um, and the top one topic that came up with this idea of communities of lack or having some sort of religious or philosophical creative community that isn't structured around some sort of positive transcendental signifier like a community that is almost structured around the absence of that it's structured around a kind of lack but a kind of creative lack I um and this is uh, you know, something that I've been thinking about in kind of in in the wake of, you know, postmodern deconstruct deconstructive thinkers like Nietzsche and Derrida is, and you bring this up in your philosophy of glimpses, right? It's this notion that, you know, uh, trying to find a metaphysics that overcomes the gap with some positive transcendental signifier, Derrida kind of deconstructed this. Sure. And I think this is... Uh, you know, Nietzsche talks about God as the stopgap or the, you know, the sort of the, the Christian metaphysics as a kind of stopgap for, I think, the, vo the void or lack or the abyss or however we want to language it, right? So then, and, you know, and there's a lot of talk about, you know, what's next after postmodernism? How do we respond to postmodernism, right? And I, I, yeah, I've, I've been thinking along these lines of how to create communities around this lack or how can, how can we source from this uh, abyss and this negativity which hegel says is the power is the power of spirit is the creative power of spirit not to overcome it but to create from it as the very production of meaning not as a final solution but as simply this almost eternal tearing with the existential problem of meaning listness as the very thing that creates meaning itself um but yeah i'll, I'll, I'll yeah i'll stop no there. that that's that's uh that's that's excellent. I think um, the question of community of absolute knowing, community of lack, you know, there's different languages for it. But for me, it all generally points to kind of a similar thing, like absolute knowing, overmen, um, y you know, I, 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 all of these kind of speak to a certain way that an individual can carry themselves in the world that is that defines rest as movement in the last net conversation we we talked about i don't actually i mentioned to this i've never actually gotten close enough to a shark to know if it's true but they always say if a shark stops swimming it dies or whatever you know that sounds good <laughs> uh you know and there's something about the problem with transcendental signifiers is that it defines rest for the human being as a certain stopping Right. Um, and this also is arguably um, trickled down from the notion of the seventh day in Christianity, Sabbath of God resting on the seventh day. Now, mm -hmm. I think this has been an unfortunate understanding of what the Sabbath is. And on the, when God rests in Genesis, it means something akin not to taking a nap, but to sitting down on a throne and ruling. Um, you know, ruling over creation, like God rests on his throne. So it's actually an active rest. It's not that God literally mm -hmm. sleeps or takes a nap or stops working. It means he, um, he rests. And likewise, when you have in Judaism, when people on the Sabbath don't work, what it means is you're letting God's rule 
have its way in your day. But the problem is that gets projected onto God in a Farbach way. It's like, oh, on the Sabbath, that means God's doing nothing as well. No, no, no. In, in Judaism, like you stop working because you're acknowledging that God is doing all the work. He's very active, so active that you don't need to be doing anything. But this is very important because it means that rest is not simply a taking a nap. It means rest is a making space for creative possibility. It means rest is making an opening for something to occur that is um, outside um, that is outside of uh, possibility. And, and likewise, what's funny, like the big argument in Christianity of like um, of Christians not needing a set, you know, there's this interesting debate with Paul where he's like, actually, Christians shouldn't observe the Sabbath because Jesus came and he unleashed his Holy Spirit. And now God is constantly working. So what's important about this is the notion of rest in both of these traditions are tied to a creative becoming. It's tied to an active operation in the world. It's not a take a nap. It's a how does one make space in their life for creative becoming? And that notion of Sabbath then actually can be tied to an ontology of lack because what one is doing is acknowledging the lack is you're, you're, you're denying completeness so that creativity always has a possibility because there's a notion that actually when you have an A is A, you're dead. Right. Because, you know, time has stopped and you have a stable identity and you're dead because the only thing with a stable identity is timeless. And what's timeless? Something that's not here. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's an effacement as opposed to a positive negation. Like I make a distinction between effacement and negation where effacement is bad. Right. It's just kind of a loss. Whereas negation is something like we're talking about in Hegel. One wants to negate stable identity to sublimate it into a creative incompleteness identity that finds completeness precisely in that lack. Um, so, you know, those kind of distinctions, um, which is kind of funny because it ultimately means that A is A is how you get effacement, whereas A is B is how you get negation, which is tied with sublation. I found that that distinction in terminology was mm -hmm. helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And like in reconstructing A is A, I'll, I'll, there's a paper called negation versus effacement, where for oh, me, yeah. you know, negation is always tied with sublation, whereas effacement funny enough, tends to be a result of efforts for completeness. Uh, you know, you end up with this effacement precisely in your effort to avoid effacement, where in Hegel or the yeah. work that you were doing, you accept the incompleteness, which actually leads to a sublation. And a way to think about it, like when we're talking about lack, um, I've been kind of looking for different metaphors by which to describe it. One, I kind of like the shark. Two, you know, you have that story in Genesis where with Lot, when he's leaving the town, God's like, hey, don't look over your shoulder at your wife or she'll turn to a pillar of salt. You know that story, right? There's something about that where if you as a human being don't look for completeness, you just engage in the becoming and you accept the lack, then you actually have a kind of completeness, but it's an incompleteness with the I and in parentheses, yeah. you know, but, but as long as you just, you know, cause right now I, I noticed some people were, you know, everyone's kind of taught, there's a question of what is synthesis and Hegel, you know, there, he doesn't really talk about synthesis, but then there's a way that there's a synthesis and it's kind of weird, like what's going on. And it's like, well, synthesis, he means sublation, which is kind of synthesis, but not, it's almost a sense in which the quote unquote reconciliation synthesis and Hegel is there until you look for it and then it's gone. So likewise, the kind of completeness one mm -hmm. can find in lack is there until you look for it and then it's gone. Likewise, you can leave, you know, Saddam, just don't look over your shoulder and then your wife turns to salt, right? It's like, you know, it's like walking on water, just don't look down and then you sink. There's something about that metaphorically. And I was writing out mm -hmm. notes this morning. There's something that there's a way that you hold yourself in lack with the moment you look because you could even in a way, if you're not careful, you know how in the paper it talks about you can turn absolute knowing actually into a totalitarian doctrine if you don't actually daily choose it and daily experience it. Like one has to be careful that a doctrine of lack itself does not secretly become a kind of totalizing picture. Well, how does one do that? Well, you have to daily engage in the act of becoming and not look for the synthesis in the lack, not look for the completeness in the completeness. It's in the perpetual sort of choice. And so in order to get that completeness, it's where you can't look down at the water, you know, or you're going to sink following that, that parable story. Um, likewise, the moment you, you live lack, the moment you look at lack, it almost turns into nothing. And therefore, and by nothing, I make a distinction also between lack and nothing. You know, I got that, you know, lacks are not nothing, where nothing is the effacement thing. Um, whereas, you know, that is where, like, when you look to lack to be totalizing, then it's gone. 
right? It actually is gone in the same way that Lot's wife like turns to salt the moment you look at it. Um, and so in order to engage in that creative possibility, there is a kind of completeness that one has a kind of synthesis of being in that um, active creative becoming as long as they don't look at it per se. As, and then it's gone. The moment you look at it, it's sort of <laughs> gone, which means yeah. <laughs> that you have to deny yourself the look. There's actually something very difficult here. There is a kind wow. of practicing. There is a kind of like actual incompleteness you have to live because you have to always, the look is what closes the circle per se. If we mm -hmm. want to like discover lack as kind of an open circle, like that symbol, um, then the denial of the look at the symbol, the denial of yourself of the look at the circle per se is what keeps it open. But then if you look at it, it closes and now it's an A is A and you lose it. And so there's something about the mental training to not fall into the temptation to look for the synthesis that then practically functions as a kind of completeness, which total sum, I would define it as incompleteness with the I and in parentheses, or I've been describing out, you know, in honor of like Ebert's paper, becoming with the BE in parentheses kind of thing is how I've been describing it. Uh, and so engaging in that practice. So then the question becomes following, and then I'll pass it back to you. What does a community of people look like who resist the temptation to look at the circle or to look at their like to look over their shoulder at, at, at Lot's wife to look for um, the synthesis so that they have a kind of um, completeness in the very denial to themselves of looking for that completeness? Like what does a community look like that manages to hold that tension? Uh, because that's very difficult because communities almost require by definition mission statements or goals or practices. But the moment you put them into language, you know, it's like Bard, you mentioned global empire. You know, the, um, I think that's book two. Uh, the moment Deleuze writes down his philosophy, it's eternalized, it's no longer mobilistic. So like, likewise, the moment you take lack and try to make a community out of it, the moment you try to make a community out of AB, it's, it's almost presented, therefore, necessarily as an AA. It is almost necessarily presented in an eternalistic-esque structure, which I think poses a, a, great, a great problem. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so many thoughts <laughs> coming up. Let me see how they're going to all land and collect themselves. Um, first this notion that I think is so important that Hegel addresses of exactly what you're saying, the moment, you know, even the logic of, of a B or sub or substance as subject, or, you know, the notion of Shinyata, which I explore yeah. as this kind of Eastern corollary to that, even, or the pure notion of becoming, right? Even these ideas, you know, Hegel says can fall into abstract universals and represent exactly. actuality itself in a non-actual manner. And so there's this, there's this weird move in which, you know, th you know, thought wants to find some self-enclosed symmetrical identity, even if it is a symmetrical identity with an asymmetric formula or logic of becoming exactly. itself. Perfect. So Perfect. this absolutely strange thing which you say right like as soon as as soon as you you look at the thing or i think in my in my paper i talk about this in in uh relationship to shunyata right like nagarjuna this this um this buddhist thinker he he uh, and actually i think he sh you know similar to derrida in this with derrida's concept of difference he, you know, wants to avoid shunyata itself being a kind of ontological substantive category or uh, perspective, right? So it kind of is constantly kind of undermining itself or is in always in the act of vanishing. So like you said, you can never finally see it and thus capture it. And there's great risk, Nargarjuna, Nargarjuna says in, and I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of his name, but in the the incompleteness itself becoming a complete concept. So there's this, uh, you know, there, I, this, 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 for, this kind of, um, this, it's like a vanishing heuristic, you know, and, and I think with the concept of difference, uh, I, I, I believe, although this is only coming from secondary writings on, on Derrida, I haven't actually read him myself, that difference serves as a, as a similarly to kind of, as, as a vanishing mediator in some ways, right? Um, so super interesting there. And I like the, the distinction between effacement and negation, 
that I've I've been using the empty negation versus sure. a determinate yeah, negation yeah, 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 as yeah, that yeah. distinction, but this this gives me new language there, and and that's so it's so huge, it's absolutely so huge, and and is is much more of a burden on the subject to try and engage in a type of determinate negation one rather than a kind of empty negation, which is often more of a lazy or easy dismissal of a thing, you know. Yes. Um, versus going through the the yeah the very difficult act of trying to understand the determinate quality of the negation so you know and thereby sublate it rather than just dismiss it this is so challenging and uh yeah i mean the fact that you know hegel obviously approaches all of western philosophy from this perspective it's just it's an it's an incredibly uh yeah, it's an incredible challenge. Um, not to interrupt you, I'll just add, uh, no, like for Derrida, words have definition until you try to define them. And then it's gone because you have to define all the right. words in the definitions. So difference, I just want to confirm, absolutely fits as what you're describing. And two, as a funny story, um, there's um, it's funny how like if you're a writer or an artist, it's almost dangerous to tell people you're writing a novel because almost the inspiration to do it goes away. Like um, Fitzgerald, uh, Hemingway, different people, they almost had a rule that if they were writing a novel, they never told people they were. Because there's something about telling people you're writing a novel that convinces you you've written it and you stop and you lose the kind of muse. And I actually always think of that phenomenological experience because I've experienced that. Like if I tell people I'm writing a paper, suddenly I have no desire. It's like gone. It's really hard to write. But if there's like a <laughs> yeah, secretness yeah. to it where I never allow myself to put into kind of an A is a form that I am writing a paper, it has this way of feeling more alive and I sometimes one of the things we talk about and then I'll give it back to you to finish um you know I'll give it back to you is I really like the phenomenology of creative acts because I think there's something about a lot of creative acts like the act of writing a novel not just the novel but the act of writing in the novel or the act of painting that is an insight into these new ontological um, schemas, ways of thinking that are found in Hegel uh, that, that you describe that the creative work is unique in sort of pointing these things out, like the very act of where you're writing a novel and your head is complete, but it's also not complete. And it's also something you're choosing to do, but it feels like it's not something you're choosing to do because the idea came, it's like a lot of creative acts phenomenologically occupy this kind of between space that is really interesting. And so I've always looking for phenomenological um like metaphoric like references to creative phenomenologies because i think they help and i certainly have experienced myself of the weirdness of when you tell someone you're writing a story you're writing a paper how it almost dies the very act of sharing it can kill it and yet one of the reasons you may share it is because people are like pressing you to tell them because they think you're wasting your time and what are you doing with your time and they're like you know you should begin a career it's like well i'm writing a novel because and you tell that to kind of defend yourself but the moment you do something dies to it or you also want to market it because if you don't market it then how are you going to sell it and so there are these pressures to put the creative act into a formula like an a is an empty notion if you will but then it dies and so it's interesting because as a as um to kind of connect to what you're saying and what we're talking about i actually find that the practice of not talking about works that aren't finished now once it's finished well yeah you put it in the world you put philosophy of blemish you put the paper because it's finished but actually i have found personally that the practice of restraining conversation or discussion about an unfinished work actually helps me keep it in an a is b space whereas talking about it early moves into an a is a and it, and it makes me think about a lot of what we're saying now of course i'll talk about it with michelle because that's my wife and we do og rose she's the o she's actually all the letters opperman garner a rose it's her middle name as well so you know i'm just the guy uh but uh oh geez. so we talk about but that's different because he's intimate in the creative act but outside of that it's something where it's like it turns it it effaces it it keeps it from by by denying yourself um talking about it it's a negation that sep then supplements it into doing the work whereas talking mm. about it early has a weird way of effacing it now i don't want to universalize that and say that applies to everyone maybe there's some people that talking about it inspires them because it puts the fire and pressure i don't know um my experience is reading a lot of biographies of different writers and painters of different people it tends to actually be more so that they gradually learn they need to not talk about works before they're done because there's something about doing that that kills it, which I just always find uh, really fascinating. So I was thinking about that as you were as you were um, speaking. Yeah, that no, that's wonderful. I that I mean that definitely feels feels resonant with with my experience with mm. with creativity. Um, the act the act of sharing the thing 
thing too early. Yeah, kind of cre creates. Uh, yeah, I think it can create the this this effacement of of the creative expression because there's something you are kind of if we're playing with this notion of creativity as kind of a certain communion with your own intimate lack. It's a very strange thing and a very sacred Ooh. thing. And when you get into that space, it's so you want to just. It's so precious and it, it can it can be killed so quickly. And that's just the process of it. But there, I think the practice or, or something I'm interested in is how to, yeah, how to create the container for that sp spontaneous happening, right? You know, I think you, like you were saying with the phenomenology of the creative act, there's something so unique about it and that it can't really be manufactured or once you over identify too much with that spontaneous uh you know creative experience is precisely the point that you can't access it and it's the you know it's this strange kind of it can be this strange struggle so you know it's a kind of like a a kind of a, an emptying you know you create the kind of empty container and hope that the spontaneous accident sort of emerges right and i think for me at least i yeah that's a that's a kind of a private um almost almost a private experience I, i'd be interested to hear what it's like to share that with another person with your wife like that to me is so that's beautiful and so fascinating i'm sure there's challenges in keeping that creative relationship uh you know sort of within that safe within that sacred container you know, right and i guess and i guess that points to another challenge of creating these kind of communities around creative lack is like yes. now all of our lacks are interacting like how to you know it's one thing to create that um that space for yourself but then another to come together with other people and try to create from a i don't know create from a collective lack like how to that i yeah i i know you you mentioned uh or somewhere i read that you created some uh community you know creative collective or something so i'm sure you have more concrete experience experience of this but i find that super fascinating um and i think like you were saying to connect it back to this notion of how to how can a you know how can an individual remain in the state of incompleteness or you know in in the certain intimate relationship with their own lack then how can a community and the very structure of a community kind of necessitate some sort of collective identity so there always is that tendency or that vulnerability for it to become an a equals a kind of relationship that is that's just so challenging to stay in that space and and one thing that comes up in that reflection when i was listening to the parallax podcast uh with Cadell they were you know they're they, they um both um there's there seems to be an understanding of the violence of over description which I think kind of connects to what you're saying right if you try and you know and there's always pressure and there's always a burden from the outside to define exactly what you're doing you know if you're creating or you know you some project like oh what are you doing what are you doing you feel as oh I need to describe it so that it's understandable and it's comprehensible and people get it, you know, and it's precisely in that act that the thing is kind of dead, right? So there's sort of an art of ambiguity involved, right? Of leaving it ambiguous enough um, so that it kind of stays, it kind of stays as, um, yeah, I don't know, as a shape-shifting lack, you know? Uh, so that's, that's, a that's, yeah, the art, the art of, uh, the art of describing something sufficient enough so that others can participate in it, but not over describing it so the thing itself dies or so it becomes prone to a kind of um, over identification with with A equals A. But uh, yeah, I'll leave it. At, I'll leave it at that. No, that's, that yeah. that's I'll say, um, you know, a few things. Um, one, um, I like what you were saying on where it's almost like when you take the creative act that kind of makes you come to terms with, well, because when you create a painting or when you paint a painting or you create a novel, it's such a weird experience because it feels like it's something you're doing and yet it's something you don't feel like you're doing. There's a technique involved. You know there's improvement, but it's bigger than yourself. It feels like something is becoming, like not only internally, but externally. Mm -hmm. It is a very strange experience that then, of course, the very fact that you're capable of doing it means you must have the ontological conditioning to make it possible to have that experience, which means there is a secret a revelation there's a truth that is being pointed to about the very nature of human beings in the creative act that i think is unique um 
because if they can do this, that must mean that human beings have something about them that allows them to do this thing. That is a mixture of choice, but also something bigger than themselves, something they know what they're doing, that they're not doing this weird, strange between space. And, you know, um, even if it doesn't happen very often, if it happens at all, means that it is possible in the world. It's possible in the universe. And therefore, the universe is a place where this is possible. So what must the universe be like so that it's possible? Well, for me, it, it means the universe must be AB, uh, not just AA, right? Now, of course, there's a kind of AA entailed in AB because there's the AA there, but you cannot reduce it to the AA. There's a kind of being in becoming, uh, but it's not a being that's a stable becoming, right? There's a kind of becoming in being, but not just a friggin' becoming. You can't have pure becoming, you can't have pure being, you can't have pure nothing, we, you know, that, et cetera, so forth. Um, so likewise, you can't have a pure A is A, even if there is something like A is A that is necessary for humans to make sense of the world and so on and so forth. Um, you know, if, if, in, if in one time in your entire life, for two seconds, you see a green cat, then green cats are possible, right? And you have to therefore make an account for how green cats can exist because you have observed them, right? Um, like assuming they haven't say had a bucket of paint fall on them, right? So, you know, <laughs> if, uh, if you, you know, likewise, if you have a single experience of a creative act of which is this intimate sort of phenomenological becoming, well, then it's possible for humans to engage in this deep phenomenological becoming. So what must human beings be like so that this can occur? For me, it screams A is B. It's a very tangible example. I think it's very tangible. Like if you've done it, well, it's tangible if you've done it. If you've never tried <laughs> to do a creative work, then it's not tangible. But if you've engaged in a creative work, then you can recount the weirdness of the experience and use that as a reference point for A is B. For me, it functions as a very useful reference mm -hmm. point to know what we're talking about when we talk about A is B. Um, because otherwise it could just sound like, oh, the opposite of A is A. Well, no, it's it's grounded in the phenomenological experience of the creative act and then explore the contours of that creative act and the crevices and the nuances to try to bring out more and more what it means to talk about A as B. I find it's the most useful phenomenological reference point uh, for describing A as B. Um, now I'm biased because wait, you know, my wife and I have the main yeah. things we do as novels. But anyway, I think I think it's very useful. Um, there's something though, I guess when you so so all of that said. When you tell people you're a writer, it's almost like what you're doing is you're taking something that's A, B, and then presenting it as an A, A, a complete identity. I am a writer. I am writing a book. Maybe that's why it has this killing effect, because now you are identifying with an A is A when the nature of the thing is A, B. And so it means you are habituating yourself to think about the thing that is A, B as an A, A, which necessarily leads to an effacement. That, that that works against what it is. And so there's something about talking about it that is risky. At the same time, um, if you write your novel and you never get feedback on it, it's hard to improve, right? So this is what, so there's a kind of art form of figuring out how to invite people into the work so that you can improve it, but not invite them in a way that you're using it for identity. Like, this is what's very tricky. It seems to have a lot to do, and I think this gets to the question of the community that you're pointing to, because I know it, like, if, what I'm saying now applies to me and Michelle. Um, there's something about the very particular way you bring someone else into the work that speaks to if you keep it in an AB versus an AA. Like mm -hmm. when you go to a cocktail party and you tell people about the work, are you seriously inviting them in to improve the work? Of course not. They're just asking what you do and you don't want to be seen as a crazy person who's not doing anything with your life. So you <laughs> want to talk about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a writer or blah, 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 uh, because you're trying to create um, intelligibility. For the person, right? But like in Unoya, you know, with the with what I help run with, like Evan Hansen and Bernard and Yo 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 uh, Rachel and Grant, different people, um, Jesse, Jess, and Stevie Ray, and all these beautiful names that I thought, um, you know, these are all artists who are also doing the creative act. You are not trying to I they they you are not trying to explain to them who you are because they do it as well and they know that it is not explainable. So when you talk about it with them, they are in the creative act. And here's the key. There seems to be a difference between people you're inviting in to become intelligible to, to and people you are inviting in to help you with the work. Like if they're helping you with the work, then it's about the becoming right? The focus of the invitation is literally about the becoming, not making something intelligible, right? That seems to be the big, big issue. And on this question of intelligibility, like you say, this pressure of being describable, this is where Deleuze is at his best, where he warns about, he says, you need your own line of flight. You have to avoid capture, you know, be incomprehensible and avoid capture. And he's really talking about how 
um, the state, if you are, if you are um, calculatable, if you are comprehensible, then you can be captured by algorithms, by the state, whatever. And, you know, Guattari is going to write that essay on how everyone's a fascist, which basically means everyone seeks to be intelligible and for the world around them to be intelligible. But the, this, of course, begs fascism because if everything's intelligible, everything is capturable. So Deleuze is all about maintaining incomprehensibility. Incompre wow, I cannot say this <laughs> word. Um, maintaining an incomprehensibility um, in order to avoid capture. Um, Deleuze's ontology, I think, fits very well with Hegel. The, the great problem with Deleuze is it would be a different conversation. I don't know why he went to war against the dialectic. I, I wish he would not have developed the epistemology he developed. Now, there may be a Deleuze scholar out there who knows more than I do on this topic and correct me, but Deleuze in difference and repetition goes to war against what he calls epistemologies of representation. And for good reason, because these epistemologies are in fact how people get controlled and they get captured. And he's trying to, we, we always have to remember that people who are writing in this period of time just came out and are still in the middle of the great traumas of massive totalitarian state power. Their number one concern is making sure this does not occur again. And the very fact though, that you, so for Deleuze, the problem with the dialectic is it, one, he's probably reading it through the classic um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, just about everyone was. They're reading a lot through the master-slave dialectic, Kojev and, and these different people. They did, um, too, too un understandably so. I mean, that is the main zeitgeist. That's the air that's going through. And so one goes to war against dialectics because dialectics risk... Um, Dialectics risk making things representable to the point where they can be controlled. So he doesn't want that. But the problem is, of course, if you don't have any capacity of representation, then you cannot really have community very much. And you end up falling into what I call essential difference. Everyone is a one of one ontology, which makes it very difficult to relate. And this can lead into, you know, I think Zizek is correct about this, where Deleuze is basically postmodernism today, which ends up being very um, dispersed very, um, it becomes difficult to have community. So you've, so you've successfully stopped totalitarianism with Deleuze, but now you, you, you do not have the resources, say, for stopping the meaning crisis. Yes, you've made sure that we don't fall into previous ways of dealing with meaning that calls violence, but it's not enough to say, um, uh, take us to the, the, the stage of addressing the meaning crisis without ending up executed, because sure, we could end up executed. I assume we don't want to be an executed Thomas More. We want to be a Thomas More that figures out a way to get out of prison without betraying our standards, right? That's kind of would be the goal, right? I mean, sure, we can say, well, we're, we're not going to fall back into nationalism. We have no idea how to address the meaning crisis, so we'll just die. Well, I, I mean, that's an option, but I, I would prefer not to, uh, I guess, anti-natalism or something like that, uh, you know, but that's fine. Um, but the, the solution would be to figure out how to maintain a higher standard without going to, to previous ways. And my critique of Deleuze is by throwing out epistemologies of representation, he's not able to take you to that next stage, even though he may help you avoid falling into Duganism or something like that. Um, so the question becomes, how does one maintain um, you know, a level of not being comprehensible so they don't fall into control or fall into fascism or different things? but not so much incomprehensibility that then you cannot address the meaning crisis because you can't form communities of absolute knowing. Well, this is where the Hegelian dialectic, this is where the science of law, this is where all these things are very, very useful. And it seems to me, and then I'll pass it back to you, it has something to do with the invitation of people into the creative work itself as opposed to identifying with the creative work so that you have a stable identity as a writer. So it's about, right, you know, per se, it's about arting versus being an artist. It's about creating versus being a creator, if I were just to use that language. And I understand one has to complexify what they mean by that. But if we just metaphorically accept that right now, it seems to have something to do with communities of people who are relating to one another in terms of creating the create they themselves are collectively a creative act as opposed to a collection of creators who identify as creators to one another because then that's an a is a versus an a b whereas if there's an emergent collective creative act 
then there's an identification with the AB itself that will make one, you'll still be incomprehensible, but you won't be alone in an isolated way that then makes it to where there cannot be community. So it seems to have something to do with that. It's interesting re reflecting back on, you know, my, my er early struggles with the paradox of identity. I feel like before I had any sort of philosophical means of articulating this, I never wanted to identify with things, even from a very young age, whatever it was. It was like I didn't Absolutely. want to say that I was a thing, an artist. I got into climbing. I'm not. A, I no, I didn't. I would like refuse to use the language and lexicon that they would even use. I don't know. There was a, a, a yeah, there was like a rebellion against this Absolutely. kind of self-enclosed identity. Right. But a desire not to want to be confined by my own uh, representations, right? Or my own sort of system of significations. But then you end up falling, which I feel that I did. And I think this is part of why I was attracted to Buddhism when I was younger is that it very much stresses the failure of representation, maybe similar to Deleuze in this way, right? But then you have the paradox of identifying with a kind of non-identity, right? You've you've looked at the lack and you're trying to identify with the lack. So it's it's this uh, it's sort of the same. You fall into the same structural fallacy of the over-identification with representation, right? So that's a that's a that's a weird uh, sort of Hegelian inversion there, right? Um, and. I think this is, and I think there's a way in which some of the um, psychological impacts of the internet kind of follow this same form, right? This fragmentation versus totalitarianism. You know, I think there's this, um, there is a, you know, we're all vulnerable to falling into a kind of totalitarian thinking or a kind of narrative structure that comprehensively makes sense of all reality or conspiratorial thinking, which, like you said, does solve a problem. It allows you to morally act in the world and it allows you, it creates a structure of meaning and it creates things that you want to move towards in which you then, you know, sort of have, uh, get the, the lived experience of meaning from, right? So it solves a problem, um, the totalitarian A equals A thinking, right? And then on the other side, there's the problem of kind of complete fragmentation, like you're saying, where we get trapped in these kind of self-enclosed um, little reality tunnels. And so there again, it's like the internet, I think, provides this weird opportunity if we can thread the needle between these two attractors for a kind of mobilistic identity. Um, yeah. Where, yeah, it's this, this weird, it's, it's staying with the tension of that, you know? Um, and yeah, where the internet, I do think it can become a, yeah, like a, a, a playground if, it, and if you approach it in the, with, with the right, maybe attitude, I think this absolute choice of, of A equals B, if you continuously make that choice, um, I, you know, I think it has, the opportunity to, you know, create this structure of the, of the creative community that is that is identified with you said, like you said, the act of creating in itself. So, yeah, yeah. I, I really like the phrase you just used on mobilistic identity. Um, I think that you know, absolute knowing, a b identity, this sort of, um, it's almost like the idea of an identity that is a continual song. Uh, like, you know, a song is like a music that you have to act to make it be there. Music doesn't appear in nature, funny enough. Sounds appear in nature, uh, but like Beethoven's Ninth does not appear in nature. Uh, you know, to make <laughs> Beethoven's Ninth occur, certain elements have to come together. You know, so there has to be certain variables, instruments. Um, there has to be skill. There has to be willingness, you know, the musicians willing to be there. There has to be a certain humility where everyone says, hey, I've got to kind of play with the other instruments, not to dominate them. Uh, there has to be a seeing of value in the other instruments. There has to be a certain emotional conditioning where you're able to sit there and say, oh, the singers gets, you know, the spotlight. But, you know, hey, I'm not someone who wants to stand up there and face that stage fright. So, you know, there's a certain like seeing your shortcomings and also avoiding your infinite. Like you could go through an entire symphony orchestra 
and see an entire arrangement of quote unquote practices that have to occur in order to make Beethoven's Ninth occur. And then Beethoven's Ninth is only going to be there so long as the act is occurring, the choice to engage in that action. And the moment everyone stops, it vanishes. To me, there's something about a community of absolute knowing or absolute or mobilistic identity that is like a Beethoven's Ninth, per se. It is like music. Um, it makes me think, you know, there is a tradition in many religions where, you know, God sings the world into being. It's not merely spoke, you know, it's actually like a singing. Like uh, Heidegger even will talk about how music is more fundamental than language. Like poetry is more fun. Like the arts are actually more fundamental ontologies than, say, uh, non artistic expressions. I always think that's quite interesting. Anyway, there's something about what we're describing as when, you know, because people talk about emergence, uh, people talk about stuff like that, which I think speaks to me again, because I love um, creative artistic phenomenal phenomenologies, because that's for me, again, as a reference point, the closest we can get to kind of glimmers metaphorically into AB that doesn't tend to fall back into AA. Metaphors are always dangerous, of course, because we tend to sacrifice the nuance for the metaphor or they function as kind of way they capture thinking. Because when you find a good metaphor, it tends to capture your thinking. But if we can think of an alive metaphor that has a bunch of parts and yet come to make together to make a harmony, I think that can help fight that tendency. Um, so there's something about what does it mean to identify with a song? What does it mean to have a kind of music identity? What does that look like? Well, it means you have to keep performing. <laughs> you have to keep practicing or it goes away. And also, when I say Beethoven's Ninth, can you really reduce that to an A is A? Kind of. But it also is made of so many parts and so many emotional dispositions, so many things that it has a stability, but it also doesn't have a stability in it at all. Uh, because even if you say, well, Beethoven's Ninth is the same instruments, I doubt any performance has ever been the same performance ever of Beethoven's Ninth. And there's all sorts of variety. And heck, just fine. Didn't talk about music, a music identity. Is any music ever the same, right? You know, there's a sense in which it's always the same. You know, it's always stable as music, but there's so much infinite variety within music that it, yeah, it's a kind of A is A, but it's not an A is A at all. It's so, so not A is A that even though it provides some semblance of identification, the identification is so open that it doesn't seem to cause, it, it, it seems less prone to cause the effacements that we're warning about. So to me, the question becomes communities of music. I want to also add that your resistance to overly identify as a rock climb, I've absolutely felt and actually think is a good thing. Um, because the tendency to quickly identify with um, speaks to a certain caving into an anxiety to be intelligible to other people. That if you cave into that anxiety, would suggest that one is perhaps not doing the training they need to do or the practice they need to do to be really good at that musical instrument so you can be part of the, um, the music community. So the learning to resist falling into certain anxieties to be understood by others can actually be a very good thing. Now, um, this is where it's always interesting because another way you can avoid identifying yourself to others is by, you know, hating people and having nothing to do with them and going off in the forest, right? <laughs> but that's not, you see, this is, I guess, the Hegelian move, right? Like, sure, in a sense, you're avoiding being by avoiding society, but you're not actually doing the work that Hegel wants you to put, put you in. You know, Todd McDowan talks about the difference between Heidegger and Hegel, where Heidegger goes to the Black Forest to do his work, where Hegel goes to the, uh, the university. Because it's one thing to engage in a, avoiding stable identity when you're never tempted to have stable identity. It's something entirely else to avoid stable identity when you're perpetually tempted by stable identity. Um, and that's the difference between, there's a kind, um, you know, religions will talk a lot about temptation, right? You know, like having, well, you know, if you just avoid the sources of temptation, that in a sense you avoid temptation, but you actually don't do the work of becoming the kind of subject that doesn't fall into the temptation. Uh, right? Because you're not ever around the thing to tempt you. And that's where, you know, that's where Hegel's like, no, you have to put yourself in the midst of the difficulty because it's only in the midst of the difficulty that you can engage in becoming, you know, in, in, in AB as opposed to AA, you can't escape, right? Um, so, you know, you can't run. If you run, you're not changing. Yeah, sure. You don't fall into stable identity, but actually you have a kind of negative stable identity because it's never challenged, right? You know, yeah. so you do actually have a stable identity when you're alone. It's almost 
feels worse though, because you are able to convince yourself that you don't precisely because you're isolated. And so it's almost then like a Calvinistic total depravity, right? Where you're like, you don't even know that you're like a stable identity because you've lost the ability to encounter other people that would make you realize that. So I think that's really, really important. Um, so in order to have the kind of absolute knowing that we're describing, I do think all of this suggests that the absolute knowing that we're describing cannot be a result of an isolationism. Um, it has to be in the midst of other people. But of course, and that therefore means you cannot be overly incomprehensible in the Deleuzian sense. Because in essence, if you're overly Deleuzian, then even if you're around other people, you're actually isolated. That would be how I kind of critique it, is that Deleuze has an ontology that makes everyone alone. They're, everyone is isolated even around other people. So that's going to practically be very similar to being the person that goes off in the forest, the Heidegger that goes to the Black Forest that doesn't have the becoming. So you need an ontology that is Deleuzean, but an epistemology that doesn't make you go to the Black Forest. And that's where I think Hegel comes in, where he brings you a kind of um, becoming ontology, but it's not a pure becoming, which is I, basically what I think Deleuze is. Now, again, if there's a world-renowned Deleuze scholar who knows why in this letter somewhere I didn't read that Deleuze corrects all this, that's perfectly fine. That's not my impress. And Deleuze has a pure, is, a, is a pure becoming. And again, for very good reason, to avoid totalitarianism. However, you know, one has to now kind of develop you know, dare I say, uh, become something uh, back to Hegel, as uh, Zizek will talk about. But, but anyway, so what does it look like? So, so therefore, um, in order to have the AB identity we're describing, you need to be amidst other people, and you need to have a philosophy that forces you to relate to them. Ergo, it seems to me to be something like a symphony orchestra, because you're around other people, and you are indeed relating to them because you have to play music with them, right? Uh, so you have to figure out what that looks like. And the identity of the community is ergo Beethoven's ninth, is the music, right? So that to me structurally seems to, well, that to me metaphorically suggests the structure of this community, of what does it, does it look like? And then, of course, the question would become, and I'll pass it back to you, the question of what is the nature of the music being made? You know, what is the thing being made? Is it ideas? Is it the learning to appreciate other people, to be there for other people? Is it to say, build a new economic model? Is it to build a new kind of university? Is it to build new institutions or is it to engage in new practices? There's the question of what is the, what is made? What comes out of, what emerges from these communities? Is that something that you should intentionally think about or will that turn it to an A is A? This is a very interesting question to me because this is like the yeah. very kind of down to earth practical questions of, right. okay, so metaphorically we've kind of described abstractly the nature of the community, but what then is the actual design, the actual economics, the actual goals, et cetera, so forth, uh, which you know uh, seems to be a very pressing question for the world today. Yeah, there's there's so many, uh, I feel like so many fascinating dialectical pairings that we've kind of uh, meandered through. I like this idea of threading the needle between a certain level of incomprehensibility, but then also being comprehensible enough um, to be able to share in the, you know, the act of creating with another person. Um, and this, this kind of, I'm, I'm, reading Thus Spoke Zarathustra right now for uh, Kindle's course and, nice. and, and thinking about this dialectic between, you know, solitude and then sociality. And I think it's similarly fall, like it's playing with this very paradox, you know, um, where you, you know, you <laughs> playing with your own, your own lack and your own solitude and then your own excess, your own overflowing libido and creativity that wants to be shared, you know, and Zarathustra says a um, few times throughout, right, that his overflowing wisdom sort of, you know, it, it, it pains him in his solitude. It wants to be shared with others. And I think that yeah, I mean, I, I've had that experience, you know, definitely many a time where it's it's like it's so much alone that you want someone to just like share it with. You want someone to share in the beautiful sunset or whatever the, you know, the, or the creative act. It's like the creative act at some point, even though it may be, you know, birthed in solitude or its initial you know, stages of pregnancy may take place in a kind of solitude at a certain point, it, you know, it does want to um commune with the world and with other people in a powerful way 
Um, so I think that, I think that's wonderful. And then again, this notion of, you know, the practicality of, of like designing or structuring a creative project or community, um, but not overstructuring it. And then, you know, if you understructure it completely, you kind of fall. I think it was Hannah Arnett. I don't know who talked about the tyranny of structurelessness, but somebody did. And I love that term. I've just stolen the term. I haven't actually read the work, but um, I do think it's a, uh, it points to something when you, to it, you know, when you leave something too incomprehensible, that creative space can often become negotiated by unconscious power dynamics and libidinal tensions and relational tensions, you know. Um, so that's another, that's another difficult dialectic to thread um, for sure. And there, uh, there was something else I was thinking of, but it's evading me. It'll, right it'll come back at two in the morning, Quinn. It, it always yeah. comes back at two in the morning. Um, <laughs> you know, first off, um, Hannah, Hart, Hannah, Hannah Arden was um, absolutely one of the great uh, geniuses. And I think it's very important to understand that when she talks about the banality of evil, she's not talking about evil being boring. She's talking about great evil occurs from a place of thoughtlessness, everydayness. Like it just becomes part of your daily routine. Um, and, and that means givenness. And this is what Deleuze is fighting against, where he understands that people have a certain sociological givenness where, yeah, we just send the Jews to the camps. That's what we do. We get up, we start our trains and it's not evil. It like transcends moral calculation because it's a routine. And her whole idea is that the great evils of, of, in, of history occur from these kind of, um, it, thoughtlessness. It, but thoughtlessness does not mean stupid. It means routine habit. It means just kind of givenness of every day. A great thinker on this, who I'm obsessed with, is named Philip Reeve, who I think was a great genius. He wrote a book mm -hmm. called Triumph of the Therapeutic, and he was warning. He warned two things. He's like, if you have too much givens, then people are oppressed, and you get the banality of evil. Is That's how I word it in Belonging Again. But if you have no givens, then people are existentially overwhelmed, and they tend to turn to a totalitarian strongman. And that's also what Hannah Arden and different people understood. If you don't, basically, it means this. If you don't thread this needle you're ending up in totalitarianism. So you better friggin' thread this needle. You're either going to get people existentially overwhelmed, which is what we see all of popularism. You know, basically Philip Reeve predicted, he's like, guess what's gonna happen? If you guys can't thread this needle, you know, y'all threw out religion, that's fine, that's all well and good. But if y'all can't throw it, you know, if you can't thread this needle, you're gonna end up with uh, another Hitler. I mean, he basically straight up says that. And all wow. of the great sociologue, Peter Berger is the same. James Hunter is the same. They all say, hey, if you can't thread this needle, you're going to end up with, um, you know, various totalitarian states. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, in my opinion, that a lot of um, the, I call them the uh, sociological philosophers, which I think Berger and Reef and so on, and, and Hannah Arden, frankly, and the origins of totalitarianism, and different things, they understood that threading this needle was a big freaking deal. And you see, we don't um, often, I think, appreciate for all of the shortcomings of religion, we don't appreciate the ways that religion threaded these needles. Um, you know, you got to have like an advanced theology for your mystics, but you also got to have something for the blacksmiths <laughs> down the street, right? You've got to have a way to gather the community together every Sunday, and you've got to take care of the orphans, but you also have to figure out how to help people vote in the elections. And eventually, unfortunately, it becomes very difficult and you, you mess up. But there was theology... And I think Bard appreciates this, frankly, you know, he'll talk about in the sin in uh, Synthosius, uh, the, the, that book where he'll talk about how theology is kind of the basement and philosophy kind of ignores it, where theology always kind of understood that, oh, crap, there's a really hard needle to thread. How in the world do you thread it? Because if you say, you know, it's like if you believe in God, then you could be Gnostic and kind of not really take care of this world. But if you don't believe in God, that can lead you open to looking for a new God and you turn the state into a God or something like that, right? So how do you thread these needles? And basically today, I think the intensity of... Um, Failing to thread this needle is extremely consequential because of all of, I guess they call it the meta crisis, where you have all these millions of, you know, global warming, right. economics, all the billions of things that are going to kill us. Basically, if we don't thread the needle, we're in huge trouble. They, you know, singularity, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, you're, I've been going down a rabbit hole of, um, I, you know, about, Eight years ago, I read all the spiral dynamics, the developmental integral okay. theory and all these different things and went down this road. And, you know, a lot of that talks about how 
there's almost a set like the rationalist communities and different things like that, where a lot of the solutions is getting a certain sort of, in, I, I want to say enlightened consciousness, basically, a certain way of thinking that carries themselves, which, um, you know, so there's a few things. When we're talking about creating a community that has an emergent result, there's a risk of this because Hegel tells us we can't create the future, right? So, it, so what's the difference between planning a community and, say, planning the future, right? You know, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Well, for Hegel, the way you kind of make the future you want to live in is by learning how to interpret the world today and the past. You know, transformation is a matter of interpretation. If you, um, which sounds weird, but if you understand, like, if you interpret human beings as A is A, you carry yourself into the future differently than if you interpret humans as A is B, right? So interpretation is practical. It's a huge mistake to think that interpretation is merely a matter of taste or subjectivity or opinion. No, taste transform... Um, interpretation changes how you carry yourself in the world. And so for Hegel, we really should focus more on how we interpret ourselves versus planning the future. Because if we focus on planning the future, we will necessarily smuggle into that plan our ideas of who we are today. And if those are wrong, then the future we make will be wrong, right? So he wants us to focus on interpretation. All right, well, there's a risk here because if we're talking about planning a community, planning communities of absolute knowing, there's a risk that one is making a what? A plan instead of engaging interpretation, right? At the same time, there's also a danger to just kind of be like stuff just magically happens, right? It's just going to evolve consciousness and we'll all be saved. There seems to be a ditch on either side of the road. And again, this very... This is another needle that one has to be thread. And I guess what I've been interested in, so there's kind of, for me, um, now this is all very speculative because I've been going through a crazy phase of writing a thousand notes after last week's NetCon. You know, I've been, I, belonging again was done in 2016 and it was like 700, now it's a 2000 page monstrosity because now I'm like <laughs> trying to get into like this question of the community. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm just a crazy person, Quinn. In all truth, I'm just a crazy person. Beautiful. Uh, but uh, thank you. I, a, a beautiful yeah. crazy person. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, but there's something that strikes me where there's this kind of idea that we address these problems because we get the right mental models, we get the right intelligence, we get the right ideas, and that's going to solve the meta crisis, right? So I, I have to walk this line. So I've, I've listened to a lot of, a ton of the, um, a lot of the game B people, you know, a yeah, lot yeah, that yeah. associated with that and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Daniel, I know Dan, uh, Daniel S. Slyermock, I can never say his Mark, name. Montenberg. Yes, yeah, he did a lot yeah. on Webber yeah. Wilson. And I do have to say, yeah. I actually really liked um, where he was talking about how global capitalism was a way to contain the problem of nuclear annihilation, but that yeah. brought with it the unintentional consequence of destroying all the resources. So what are we going to do now, now that our previous way of holding back, you know, super annihilation is gone? Uh, I thought some of those diagnoses, and he talked about with the animals that they tried to help and it made another issue worse. I thought there were some nice things that he, he was saying. Um, a lot, but my impression though, of a lot of the thinking that comes out of individuals is, is a kind of idea that there's a sort of development of consciousness, that if you get a changing of thinking, that that is going to be part of the, the solution to the meta crisis. So there's a kind of evolution of consciousness. Um, whereas, as we all know, you know, Alexander Bard, um, and I'm very sympathetic to this, and cadet, you know, with the, in the debates, is this notion that humans don't really change that much. Like their kind of pathos is always there. There's not really much essential change. So if your idea of saving the world requires an essential change in how human beings carry themselves, that seems to be a problem because that's not going to really happen. Um, you have to take seriously pathos. If you don't take seriously pathos, you're going to have an issue. Um, at the same time, we do have to keep in mind that a lot of the spiral dynamic stuff, and I also honestly, Quinn, I'd be curious what you think of this. I don't really understand, and maybe I'm just stupid, I don't really understand a lot of the differences between the integral theory, spiral dynamics, why the colors change, why Wilbur did all those different things. I'm, I don't, it feels like it created a lot of confusion and I don't quite <laughs> understand it. Um, I don't know, maybe somebody knows something, I don't. Um, but you know, a lot of integral theory, like I was reading, about you know I but you know I remember when I read Siri Ab he starts with an A Siri Arabosia I remember where he talks about the super consciousness the cosmic consciousness clear light <laughs> something about clear light I remember this stuff and I'm not very sympathetic 
to any sort of idea of enlightenment and so on and so forth. But then um, when I look at spiral dynamics independent of integral theory, because I associate Siri, S-I-R-I. Wow, people will be upset. I can't remember his uh, Arab, Arab, A-U-R-O-B-O-S-C or something. Arabindo? Yes. Yeah, so, oh, that, yes, yes. Arabindo is not there. Okay. Um, where um, th th that seems to be integral theory. Where spiral dynamics is sort of a following a way that these different kind of personality. Spiral dynamics is not just a, like there's actually like research on people having different ways of disposition and different sort of consciousness and different things like that. I And it doesn't really spec the moment you start talking about tier three stuff. I guess they talk about tier one, tier two and tier three, where tier three is like cosmic consciousness stuff. I'm not a big fan of tier three. <laughs> uh, but when they're talking about, I guess, oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, I think it's yellow and turquoise are these kind of like these personalities that can handle paradox and they see truth and all these different Personal. sort of things. It sounds very Hegelian to me when you talk about yellow, especially turquoise. The coral is where you lose me because then it turns into this like cosmic unity thing and it's not really research. They're just speculating that, oh, if yellow turned into turquoise, what would follow from turquoise is coral and <laughs> coral must be... Ex well, now the owl of Nineveh yeah, flies. Yeah. You're now, you're not listening to Hegel now. You're, you're assuming what will come next. So if I just cut off spiral dynamics there and I just talk about yellow to turquoise, it sounds to me, okay, that sounds like... That sounds like the emergence of, of absolute knowing kind of people. And if we separate that from integral theory and cosmic consciousness and all that, okay. So it sounds like there is research to suggest there is a certain percent of the population that, um, that is absolute knowers. Okay. The question would be the following. How did they emerge? What made them occur? How do they exist? Um, and the question would be, how does one form communities where they where they happen? This is what I want to argue. Um, well, this to me is the million dollar question. This is like the huge dollar question. Um, I want to suggest that instead of a doc, like a structure of a spiral where people say yeah. kind of climb up consciousness, I almost want to think about a cone dynamics where it's like a reverse cone instead of a spiral. And you see Ooh. where there's a minority of people and then it kind of spreads and goes out. You know how a cone is kind of like that. And I want to argue that it's not so much that consciousness evolves but it's a cultural adaption strategy to a certain cultural situation that you are in. When you are in a pluralistic society, the reason you become turquoise or yellow is not because you have an evolved consciousness, but because you have to survive with the fact that there's radical difference. And if you're going to say that they're all wrong except you, you're in tribalism, and that becomes a bad survival strategy. I guess I want to introduce more evolution, you know, evolutionary thinking, which we forget is natural selection. Evolution does not mean like a... Uh, it's not necessarily progressive. It's a it's a response to your environment, you know, where, you know, you respond to your environment in a certain way that makes you X way. And so people become yellow and turquoise as it not a evolved consciousness, but a cultural adaptation to the realities of radical difference that they encounter. And they don't fall into the temptation of structuring givens. Um, blue, green, given, you know, I guess it's blue, orange, or whatever. It's like modernism. Green is postmodern or whatever. It's called. Anyway, they don't fall into the bad answers to the meaning crisis, right? So you encounter difference and you resist Duganism, and that puts you in either yellow or turquoise or tier two in spiral dynamics. Um, whereas other people, when they encounter difference, they fall back. So, so then we need to understand that spiral dynamics, if we talk about cone dynamics, is not an evolved consciousness, but cultural adaptation to pluralism, to globalization. And I think you can then, then for me, you can talk about how humans don't fundamentally change like Bard does, but also acknowledge the reality of different personality types without talking about some sort of development of human consciousness that acts like we're escaping our prehistoric man, which is what, you know, Bard and, and Cadell are warning with Game B. It's like, you're talking about like human beings are fundamentally changing on the conscious level. No, 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 no. What I guess to me, if we want to try to figure out how to balance those, if you talk about cone dynamics, you can say that human pathos is constant, but humans develop different cultural adaptation strategies by which to survive their environment. You see what I'm saying? This seems to be the middle ground. The reason this is all hyper important is because if indeed yellow and turquoise are absolute knowing kind of people and they have arisen as a result of cultural adaptation, not evolving consciousness per se, 
then the way you create communities of absolute knowing is by spreading the social conditions that lead to that cultural adaptation. Okay, like because you have the social, the social economic structure that then people are culturally adapting to to survive without following into Duganism or tribalism. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So the question becomes the following. What is the main source of the cultural adaptation <laughs> of yellow or turquoise? I will pause it because here's the other thing I want to say. I always have this question with spiral dynamics. You know how it is very likely if you go in the country you're going to encounter like Republicans. And if you go into cities, you encounter right. liberals. Yeah, yeah, Why? Yeah. Well, that would mean that people's ideology tends to inflect their environment, right? Uh -huh. I, I bet you that colors and spiral dynamics correspond to areas in the same way that political ideologies correspond to areas, which by the way, if spiral dynamics reflects evolving consciousness, that should, that should not be the case. If there's an evolving consciousness that is non-contingent to environment, um, then it should not be clusters of colors and areas. Do you see what I'm saying? But if there are clusters of colors, that would mean that spiral dynamics is, as, is actually cone dynamics, like I'm describing it, that it's actually a cultural adaptation. So this is then what I would want to know. I would want to know where are the collections of say turquoise and yellow we need to examine the, so the sociological structure there and spread that around the freaking world. And that's how you have the meta, that's how you have, you address the meta crisis, basically. Um, I bet you it has a lot to do with the internet. And I want to say is that rather than fo focusing on everyone getting the right rationalist mental models, we need to freaking spread the infrastructure of the internet like crazy, like <laughs> really fast. Now, of course, <laughs> because then people culturally adapt to that in a manner that makes them yellow or turk or or green or or turquoise, not green. Green is postmodern or whatever. Or communities of absolute knower. So suddenly, the reason why I guess it's become very interesting to me on the question is, of is it spiral dynamics or is it cone dynamics? Because then the strategy you engage in to creating communities of absolute knowing or spreading absolute knowing or spreading AB is radically different. If you have a metaphoric structure of a spiral, then it's about educating everyone into rationalist communities and giving them the right mental models. And you basically deny the existence of pathos. But if it's cone dynamics, pathos is constant, so you better be careful. You better never create a society that pretends like pathos is not there but and then you focus on the material conditions which people adapt to that makes them yellow or turquoise do you understand what i'm saying so you're so what you focus on completely changes so to me i i it would seem to me that has a lot to do with the president of the internet it has a lot to do with giving people the resources to engage in their own intrinsically motivated journeys. That seems to be a big part of it. It seems to have a lot to do with incentivizing people to create um, like material on YouTube, like Philosophy Portal, like VoiceCraft, these different things that people can engage in. And it also seems to have a lot to do with creating social permission to be philosophical or to explore identities of becoming. And that that seems to be a lot of what this is about, not evolving because because humans are i agree with bard and and last and i humans are very consistent through history but then at the same time i can't deny that spiral dynamics is based on research like there's literally people who have a better relationship with paradox than others Again, if we throw out tier three, clear light, Ken Wilbur, cosmic consciousness stuff, clear light. you know, whatever, if we throw that out, or let's put it this way, if we bracket it out, sure, maybe it's true in alterology, like I call it alterology, like some sort of theology sort of thing, right. that's fine, I have no problem with it, but if we're asking the question of um, spreading um, communities of absolute knowing, it's very important to understand if the right metaphor is a spiral, or if it's a cone, um, and I think it's a cone, which means it's about material condition, which means it's about internet, socioeconomic conditions, permission to be philosophical, the ability to engage, to not feel like you have to identify yourself. Like, what is a, like, you talked about this pressure of having to identify yourself, right? What would a world look like if people didn't feel pressured to identify right, themselves right, as right, a writer. Right, right. If they existed in a material condition that didn't make them feel pressured to tell everyone they're a novelist, yeah. well, they would be more engaged in AB identity, which would make them 
not capturable by the state, um, but would also not make them isolated, like the Black Forest Heidegger we talked about. Now, of course, spreading the internet is dangerous because people can get captured by algorithms. They can use it for TikTok. They can use it to destroy their, um, you know, their attention, and they could use it for tribalism and different things. But at the same time, if indeed we accept the premise that the meta crisis is going to doom us all, I mean, it basically the game beat people like if there's not some sort of development of consciousness, we're all done. Well, then this might be a necessary risk. Right. Um, so, you know, because otherwise we're in trouble. So to me, I've been thinking a lot about that. And if it if indeed um, cone dynamics is more of what's going on, which is a cultural adaptation versus an evolved personality or developing personality or all that stuff. Um, well, then focusing on the availability of certain infrastructure is the name of the game. Because then the thing about the internet, we said this earlier, and then I'll give it back to you, is the internet is very open. You're, yes. you're in fact, you're not planning the future. You're giving everyone a resource by which to gain new means of interpretation. The spreading of the internet as a initiative seems different than planning a community of absolute knowing. It seems like if you're, if you're very practically, very focused, on economically and financially spreading the internet in terms of infrastructure, that seems like you're creating resources to change people's way of interpreting the world versus planning a community. So that to me seems like the middle ground between like um, overly planning the future, but then sitting back and doing nothing. You're indeed tilling the soil, you're making the soil for a garden, but then you're letting the seeds grow themselves. So that's another reason why that particular infrastructure initiative um, as like really focusing on that seems like the middle ground between uh, what Hegel warns between planning the future, but also working on interpretation. So to me, that all seems to be part of it. But these are all things I've been recent, you know, I've been thinking about scribbling out belonging again is very long, and they've never seen the light of day. So you just get you're just getting to suffer that today. So again, cone dynamics, internet, uh, stuff like that. Oh, that was that was wonderful, Daniel. Yeah, I've always yeah I I have not engaged super deeply with like integral and spiral dynamics and this sort of thing. Although I will say that I do tend to have an allergic reaction yes, to yes. Um, well, and I'll know kind not, of hierarchical development. Yeah, and one of the things I guess that, just as a quick note. I yeah. guess one of the reasons I've over the like Deleuze hated Hegel and in my opinion became very Hegelian and right. like a lot of thinkers who dislike something actually would have gained a lot to push into that dislike. I oh, naturally yeah. really, really do not like anything involving personality like types, Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, <laughs> all of that to me is like astrology, it, like bad <laughs> astrology, like not good astrology, like conspiratorial crap. So basically I was like, I was like, I took a deep breath. I said, I'm going to yeah. force myself. I'm going to force yeah. myself. I'm going to force myself, you know, basically. No, I think, I think that's the right move, right? It's like, okay, why do I have a reaction to it? Okay. Let me try and en engage it a little bit more, right. you know, deeply, especially when these things become sort of, you know, viral and you yes. know, viral themes. And there, there's something there because people are interested in them. And I think, you know, that, that does sort of, um, make them worthy of some sort of engagement, right? Um, right. But the yeah, so there's so many things that were coming up. So I yeah, I absolutely. Um, I mean, it's like it's kind of like the traditional, you know, the kind of dialectic almost, but you know, between the environment and the individual, right? Which has more what and what kind of emphasis are we placing on right. placing in either one, right? And what I what immediately came up to me was I'm just reading through uh, Daniel Fraga's book Ontological De Design. Nice, Mr. Right? Fraga. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So wonderful, and I feel like um, this question is kind of almost at at the heart of it. Yes. In some ways, right? And, and it's and I think there, I guess the initial one move is. Well, first off, I think historically, you know, post card and individualism and these sorts of things has overemphasized the degree to which the individual kind of creates their own reality, right? Sure. And has uh, kind of, you know, severed the, you know, severed the individual from its environment. Um, and I think this has allowed and afforded certain collective systems of exploitation to really function well right the kind of the cult of individualism 
um, is perfect for for capitalism as as a as a mechanism that harvests uh, attention and and subjectivity, right? And so there's already you know, and Fraga points to this war of subjectivity um, and kind of does the Hegelian move where um, it we you know we have to think of this strange loop between the individual and the environment. And I think, you know, I think this kind of connects to what you're saying. It is sort of like, okay. And I think, you know, this, right, this connects to Bards uh, and I guess Cadell, you know, sort of, and McLuhan, I think, which, oh, sure. which Bard was drawing on, which was a fascinate fascination for me is, is looking at the change in underlying informational technology or um, media, right. As sort of, being the catalyst for different paradigm shifts and so then bard talks about okay we have to talk about paradigmatics which is kind of like starts with kind of an amoral analysis of technology what is the actual infrastructure what kind of things is it and this is very McLuhan. what kind of things is it obsoleting and what kind of new modes of being you know is it affording and so we can you know we can't in terms of the question of ontological design, it's sort of like we can't design outside of the very real material technological technological conditions that we're subsumed within. And so I think this brings to light that, you know, the idea of um, mobilism or Hegel becoming super relevant again or, or McLuhan or these sorts of uh, or even... Um, I think there are, there are certain ways in which we, you know, if we are going to ask the question about, like you're saying, designing certain environments so as to catalyze a certain mode of being or a certain kind of community. Um, how might we be able to realize in ourselves and in communities this identity of A equals uh, B or absolute knowing? And it's not just, yeah, a sheer will of developmental consciousness, you know, or meditating enough in a cave or whatever, right? There's a very real, pragmatic, I think, creative question that, you know, Fraga takes up as this very practical question of design, which I do think begins with a kind of amoral analysis of the technological conditions that we're operating in and what kind of modes of identity does it afford. And I do think that, like you're saying, the internet does afford this this kind of uh, mobilistic mode of identity. I think right. there is a way in which it is creating the kind of technological and material conditions for us to participate in designing that kind of ontology. Or even it's creating almost the, if we just use Fraga's book as um, like, like the fact that that book is being written or the question of ontological design is being asked in some ways, I think is very, uh, it points to the fact that certain technological conditions is affording the possibility to have ask that very question. Yes. So we can become ontological designers, which is a radical invitation to create this kind of AB identity. I think it's, it's right. It's absurd. And I think, Historically, it was, and um, and the notion of the individual as being kind of an affordance of of technology in the internet, I think, is really fascinating, as Bard talks about. And historically, there was definitely more of a pressure to maintain a kind of continuity of identity. I think there was just le there, you know, there was less. Um, but yeah, there was less affordance to shapeshift as you know and sort of have your identity be this creative project in, in and of itself so i think i think right it's sort of like we can't that thinking that weird feedback loop of ontological design that the environments we try and design design us in return and then our transformed subjectivity then designs new environments it's so it's sort of like it's in the, it's like a cone, cone dynamics and spiral dynamics meet in some strange, sure. in some strange marriage. Like it's not just one or the other. Although I will say, I think the emphasis, I would put more of the emphasis on the cone, the cone dynamics um, that, you know, that, that, and this is, I think the move from the printing press and individualism yes. to the realization of interactive, you know, 
tribal organizations. We can't just de design our ontology um, in a solipsistic self-enclosed way. We have yeah. to design our ontology within communities, within um, within tribes. Um, so, well, but well, however, uh, well, one last thing then. Please, 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 but I, I do think like we can't do a, like, and I think your paper, the, you know, the absolute choice points to this, like no matter how well anyone designs and uh you know the, the the environment or we you know we design the environment for people to uh sort of you know realize themselves as absolute knowers there is always that choice right there is yes. always that there is for that there is always the anxiety of that freedom to choose a is b That's right. so you know right there's always there always there's that always that trap of the which is another kind of totalitarian move it's like if only we can design the environment exactly. and material conditions to perfection then that choice becomes no choice and they're all they you know it's like enlightenment is sort of um catalyzed by the very in, environmental structure that we have and it's like no there's oh right there's always that that there's always the 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 terror and the wagering of your own identity in that process so yeah I, I think that's brilliant. Um, I, you know, a few things. I think it was very good that you brought up um, Daniel Frege's ontological design. I will add, necessarily the individual experiences transformations in their way of thinking in terms of a kind of spiral dynamics. The issue is using spiral dynamics yeah. in terms of how to have social change. And yes. the more you move toward yes. a social change, the more you must emphasize the material condition. I think Marx is correct about this. Yeah. However, there's also, this is what's interesting. So there's something about, there's two sides to this equation it seems to me the question of the material condition and the um orientation of the subject and basically yes. if i'm to cut straight yes. to the chase you have yes. to have Wonderful. materially i would emphasize the spreading of the in of the um of the emphasis of uh, the internet and subjectively in terms of the subject i would emphasize the making of the absolute choice which basically for me entails yeah. all the philosophy that we do like choosing to take that seriously if you want to be very general about it i don't think that merely giving the internet to everyone is going to uh, <laughs> save us from the meta crisis. Because I take very, very seriously the economic work of Dietrich McClowski, who I think shows very well that ideas radically changes the world before anything else. Like um, you cannot explain, say, how people, how the world developed in what she calls the great enrichment simply by talking about, say, access to um, steam engines. You also have to have a transformation in how people think about themselves. And she, you know, talks about two major macro ideas that transformed everything. Um, one, you, the idea that came out of the Dutch empire, uh, I guess in the 1680s or something, um, which would say work has dignity. You know, there is dignity in work. For most of human civilization, work had no dignity. Actually, to engage in work meant you weren't a gentleman. Like a gentleman was someone who did not work. Like a very sign of having status was not working. But then this notion came along that work has dignity, that actually engaging in work has um, a, a kind of dignity to it. The second idea, um, and this comes out of philosophy, uh, is that people should be free to do the work they want to do, that they should not be controlled. You put those two ideas together and you get people, it turns out what people do when they're free and they're told that work has dignity is they start making inventions to solve their problems. And you have an explosion of invention that occurs once you get those two ideas. And she goes through and argues that those two ideas, it wasn't that those ideas emerged out of invention. It was that those two ideas led to invention. And for her, it's a big deal to get the, um, to get, to yeah. get the order mm -hmm. correct. Because you'll say up to before 1680s, you know, China was the um, was the uh, the invention center of the world with paper and gunpowder and different things like that. But then between 1680 and now, the amount of inventions that have occurred is just completely through the roof. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, the changes that have happened. And we just, we forget that wealth is invention. It's not money. It's invention. It's lighting, air conditioning, pie, refrigerators. These are what increase the average person's quality of life, not the dollar bill. No matter how much money King Louis had, he couldn't get a laptop, right? Um, so technology is wealth, basically. Um, and so the question is, what generates technology? Well, 
um, I, it, ideas start it, and then it's a feedback loop. You see, that's what happens, right? You get ideas, and then you make technology that gives you new ideas, that then makes new technology, and it kind of has a big feedback loop. But it's a, it's a dialectical, the way I describe it in our economic work is a dialectical relationship between creativity and energy, because technology is very much tied yeah, yeah. to energy use and different things. And so the question becomes, so if you want to, say, solve the meta crisis, there's two areas that you address. Um, the way people use their energy, which you could also see creativity into ideas and technology, you could also put it down to, and you yeah, transform yeah. people's ideas. All right. So the two things you want to address then is access to the internet and thinking in terms of the absolute choice, or we'll just say A, B. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I think you do have to have that absolute choice. Obviously I'm biased because I wrote the paper, uh, but because it has to have an emotional component, just simply having right. the idea of AB, we said it earlier, you could have a pure becoming a pure AB, a pure notion that therefore there's no life in it. So you have to have the choice. So you need, you need the thinking and choosing and living according to AB plus access to the internet. And that seems to be what then creates the conditions of a more widespread absolute knowing or tier two and spiral dynamics or these different things of which then people can form communities of absolute knowing in a manner that is more emergent as a result of new ways of interpreting life versus a plan for how we're going to change the future. And that to me seems to be right on the cusp of how to have it, how to have a Hegelian response to the yeah. meta crisis, as opposed to a overly rationalist response to the meta crisis. Um, and think, and also too, I guess then I'll emphasize energy because if we understand that say the main, the, you can correspond GDP with energy use very closely. And this gets into like Chad Haig's yeah. work and different things. So the way we get energy or use energy radically transforms the entire economic system. Well, you take that seriously, then you emphasize new ways to make technology. I mean, literally, like so much of the meta crisis is a result of fossil fuels, right? I mean, it's a result of an over-reliance on a single form oh, of no. energy. Well, no. you get a communities of absolute knowing to figure out how to solve that problem and to create infrastructure around that, you know, that, that changes things. But here's the issue. If you talk about changing the energy and chad haig is very good on this he says if you give it an oil you're literally going to like like people's very paradigm for what the future will leads to is tied to infinite consumption infinite progress oil and different things you run out of oil you start talking about cycles well that completely kind of meta that changes people's meta frame by which to understand history right if people you're never going to basically if we take chad haig's work seriously you will never transform energy to something sustainable unless you first philosophically transform people to be ready for that change of the energy source of which will <laughs> meta of which will transform their metaphysical framework by by which to understand reality like if you like because once you like chad haig's whole idea is that gasoline fossil fuels bring with it a certain deep meaning of how you think about human civilization and what ends up happening is you know fossil fuels makes you think and he talks about like a growth like an art like a curve that goes up infinite progress where before fossil fuels and agricultural societies it's more like a circle you think so, about reality in terms of seasons and different things right so his whole point is if you run out of gas you have to make people realize that their meta, you know, their meta structure of history is wrong. And that's going to be very destabilizing because what do people do when they lose their givens? They go crazy. We talked about this earlier, right? So if you're like, if your goal, this is, I guess what I'm saying. This is why Hegel's so correct about the dangers of overemphasizing planning as opposed to emphasizing interpretation. Like if we right now, right, right. you know, if we right now switch to alternative energy, and at Chad Haig, the closing, like toward the end of his book, he says, literally changing oil will change people's truth into falsity right in front of their very eyes because it will change their metaphysics. Um, so if we change gasoline to alternative energy before making people absolute knowers, it's probably going to lead to a um, uh, social upheaval, to say the least. It will be an uprising. People will not be very happy. So... Even though it's true what Game B and Sly Ma and different people talk about, about needing to change energy, the question is order, 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 order. It's all about order. Right. And what we're basically saying is that you need to prioritize right now the spread of the internet and the spread of AB thinking, and then 
you can start moving into alternative energy. But if you right now try to change people's energy and structure the economy without changing their thinking of which becomes emotionally possible thanks to the internet that exposes them to difference, you're probably just going to have a lot of fascism. You're probably just going to have a lot of popularism and it's probably not going to work very well. And the whole meta crisis constantly talks about figuring out how to balance all the variables. Like yeah. how do we balance changing energy without causing a nuclear apocalypse? Like how do we, uh, you know, change the economic model without like warfare between all the nations well it's uh, it's a matter of order uh yeah. it's a matter of the order you do it in and you know saint augustine so brilliantly put forth he's like hey all you know in christianity all sin is a misordered good there's nothing evil about sex but lust is a misordered relation to sex nothing wrong with food gluttony is a misordered relation to food so all evil for augustine is a disordered good so yeah. order is everything well, likewise, order is everything in Hegel. Like if you prioritize changing energy before creating the, um, before spreading internet and spreading AB thinking, because I think Chad Haig is correct, uh, then you're going to cause that nuclear apocalypse you want to stop. You're going to cause that Duganism you, wanna, you don't want to have happen. So the order is a really big deal. And for me, um, the reason why I would emphasize cone dynamics over spiral dynamics, because even though there is, there is something true about a kind of individual development that has a kind of spiral structure to it. If you emphasize that too much, you will think about that as being what occurs on the social level. Yep. Therefore, you will not emphasize the spreading of a certain material condition. And you will not also emphasize using that material um, condition, say the spreading of the internet to spread certain ideas, say AB thinking, like the idea McClowski talks about, about work having dignity and people being free. And therefore, it will not, you will not rightly order the paradigm shifts that you need to occur so you can get all of fossil fuels without causing a rise of fascism and World War III. So order here is a very, very big deal. Um, and that's where, to me, emphasizing cone dynamics is a big deal because, sure, as you do the cone dynamic stuff, and I have to draw it out because the color spread in the middle is wider and the top is small and it kind of spread like it goes down and spreads as a culture. And I have to describe all that. Um, but if, if you don't Think in those terms. And yeah, as that occurs, there's something like spiral dynamics that can happen on the individual level. That's fine. But in the same way that I want to bracket out tier three integral theory, because that is kind of religious alterology for me. That's you know what I mean by alterology is Enrique is a Likewise, I'm going to bracket out from my emphasis, spiral dynamic individual development, because I cannot systemize that and it's high order complexity and it all varies for individuals and you can't really systemize that. And instead, think about on a systems level, something Hegelian that, in, that focuses on interpretation, not planning. And that gets me into um, the dialectic between technology and ideas, energy and creativity, which means I AB ideas plus infrastructure of spreading internet. And that seems to be um, what needs to be done now so that it's in the right order with, say, changing energy, where if you get those backwards, if you put those in the wrong order, you could have a, dis a disordered good, disordered goods. Both of those are good things, but in the wrong order, they're disordered. Um, and that leads to evil in Augustine. And that would lead to a, um, a loss of control on the meta or a loss of balance with the meta crisis that will lead to it all getting out of control and... Um, uh, last time I looked, it's not good if the meta crisis gets out of control. So hopefully that would not occur. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's wonderful. Now that yeah, that this idea. Well, first, I think when talking about the meta crisis, and I love. I mean, Daniel Schmachtenberger is you know he's an incredibly sure. lucid, lucid thinker and you know brilliant in his articulation, um, but. But yeah, there's this tendency that I think is so intimate to thinking in general and is part part and parcel kind of of the solution orientation is to run away into kind of future oriented planning, yes. right? It's so it's so easy. Yes. Um and it is precisely at this and I think Daniel does a good job of bridging the personal and the universal and, and, and embody. I mean, he emphasizes embodiment, but oh, yeah. so do some people, but there's the, there's a way in which that move for me, at least I can just speak, can be incredibly disembodying too, when you project yourself too far into the future and try and create this, um, 
this top-down future-oriented uh, meta meta structure that will kind of resolve resolve things. It's uh, it's very tempting, but I I do agree with Hegel in this way that um, it can be dangerous. Um, oh, yeah. And this what you're what you're emphasizing here interpretation as a creative act in and of itself. I think is yeah is absolutely beautiful um and this and this emphasis on the dialectic between ideas and technology um and so i just to see if i'm if i'm if i'm following here because there's so much awesome stuff in there you're saying that if we change we obviously have to think this and well, actually, this brings me to one idea I was thinking of when you were speaking, which is an idea from John Berveke that that I really like, which is reciprocal opening versus a kind of reciprocal narrowing. Mm. And I think emphasis and ordering, like you're saying, is really critical to create a kind of dialectical reciprocal opening versus maybe, you know, if you if you if you initiate complete, you know, renewable energy now and do it with fossil fuels completely, while that, you know may solve a certain problem or be good from a certain perspective it may actually create a kind of reciprocal narrowing exactly. dynamic in which you get civilizational collapse anyway which yes. is kind of thing we seem to all be trying to avoid right so what's the right recipe to create that kind of dialectical reciprocal opening where there's you know and i and it's and so it seems like are you emphasizing kind of shifting underlying ideas or onto epistemological orientation over um changing material conditions but it seems like you're I, i'm trying to figure out if you're if if there's a, an order of operations here or a uh, a greater degree of emphasis on one or one or the other it seems like you're saying get the internet out there and also we need to we need to change our kind of onto epistemological you're, you're asking a tremendous question and uh no it's well the issue is it um it's very difficult to speak dialectically without speaking about one side of the dialectic at a time right, ergo right. sequentially therefore creating an impression of emphasis over one or the other right. it's very so for example um if a lot of people get a b thinking but you don't have an internet by which to encounter difference. The AB is going to be a pure AB uh, right. because you're not actually inter interacting with different people. Also, without the internet, the likelihood of a lot of people coming to terms with AB is quite low because right. what is the probability that in your immediacy you would encounter people that have to go? Thank you. So one has to do both simultaneously. At the yeah. same time, if you do neither of those and you change the energy source, since I think, you know, I'm making the example of Chad Haig's work, since I think he is correct, that people's very way of thinking about the world is intimately tied with energy, then yeah. if you change energy from something that um, speaks of a progressive, an infinite progressive narrative to one that's going to go back to a cycle, that is going to create an existential instability that will lead to political, social, cultural uprising and give you the meta crisis anyway, right? So it's a question of order and dialectic. So like, to be clear, right now, um, as I've been thinking, you know, right now, the name of the game seems to have a lot to do with a emphasis on um, internet and I in AB thinking and doing yeah. both simultaneous. And also the other thing I will say with that though, is there has to be a way for people to economically sustain themselves in the practicing and the learning of A-B thinking, right? So yeah. I would also add to that, I have papers on um, the breakdown of the college monopoly on credentials, because you basically have to go to college to get a good job. Um, you also have intellectual property right problems that makes it difficult to make money on the internet. You have a um, you have a mixed market dynamic that creates an incentive for free markets to become mixed market and for entities to become too big to fail, which destroys market rationalization. Um, um, and you have that big one. The big one is the college monopoly on credentials. Whereas if you're competent, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you, it shouldn't matter if you go to college or not. Um, you should have the credentials and ergo be able to make the money. So you also have to change those kind of things so that the creative expression on the internet is able to economically sustain itself and to become self-propelling. So I'm not saying that merely like, but this is the fine balance. Like what is the difference? So this is what's always the, the needle you're trying to thread. You're trying, to, you're trying to figure out how to actively do things that have socioeconomic ramifications that don't, though, constitute planning for the future. This is what's really weird, right? <laughs> like, like, you see what I'm saying? Like, for me, 
tearing down the, the monopoly on credentials that colleges have does not constitute designing the future. It, it, that constitutes making more space for individual possibility. Because now you can't simply be, uh, you know, you can't simply get the position because you went to college. You literally have to have the ability, the creative act to prove yourself as being better than some random person on the internet uh, because what's judged is the actual skill not the piece of paper, right? To me, that is not the same of designing the perfect society. That's making, that's making space for more people to be involved in the possible becoming of now. So there seems to be, I guess the way I talk about it, there seems to be a difference between clearing and planning. Like there seems to be a difference between clearing and planning. You see what I'm saying? Hegel seems to be emphasizing a kind of clearing. It was also, is also funny enough, Heideggerian language. And I, and I would, yeah. I have a lot to say on Heidegger. I won't, I go back and forth on how I feel about him. Um, I like him some days and then other days I'm not sure. And then I just curl up in a ball and I say, I need to read everything twice. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, so there's something about clearing. So to me, there is something to be said about needing to do very tangible socioeconomic things now to create clear for certain ideas and ways of living to uh, sustain themselves, right? And that would be like breaking up the college monopoly on credentials, emphasizing that the fun, the source of um, intrinsic value for an economy is a dialectic between creativity and energy, uh, changing the intellectual copyright laws. I also, you know, Anthony and I he, at Intrinsic Research Co. talking about Web 3.0 to have a new pricing mechanism that is not based on analog entities, but how to accurately price and accurately distribute uh, digital assets, which seems very important. So a new pricing mechanism that yeah. would actually be bringing in some of the NFT stuff. I think right now, unfortunately, most of Web 3.0 is speculative, but there yeah. is actually, I think I've been convinced of an underlying um, of market mechanism that can help us overcome the problem of investing directly in value. Now, that's an entirely different subject. But to me, that does not constitute a plan. That constitutes a clearing. Because what you're doing is you're, you're making more efficient the becoming of the already existing, okay? So there are things we need to do now to help more, to help realize the already existent becoming. That's what I'm calling. Yeah, clearing. yeah, yeah. I still think exactly right. Like it's it's and and I think the the kind of those kind of interventions that you're talking about are in themselves part of a reinterpretation of our current. Yes, so that's exactly right. Given the digital interactive age, like, and I think this is. Uh, I mean. McLuhan talks about this and 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 Bard and Sledeklis, uh, however you pronounce yes. that, talk about this as well as it's like the when the underlying material and technological conditions shift, you know, it always takes human subjectivity a little bit of time to catch up, right? And figure out how to align their own subjectivities and then the collective um ontological structures or the yes. collective kind of modes of of eco economic and social engagement how to design those so as to be kind of harmonious with the changes in the new technology and so i think while you know web3 is in its infancy i do think some yeah a lot of the things you just mentioned are all attempts at like create like uh, reinterpretation as an act of yes, as an act of creativity. Um, so so I yeah I I, I think that's Absolutely. fantastic, and I think just like um, I'll oh, just do, yeah Please. one more point. I mean I think like you were saying, cr creating yeah, creating a clearing, these sorts of things, and even even the problem of the monopolization of credentials with the college campus, right? How do you how do you respond to that? What do you actually do? And I think that. You know, the voice craft thing uh, that you mentioned and Cadell's courses and, you know, the work that you're, you're doing, like these sorts of things are, in my opinion, creative uh, acts of like creative yes. acts that interpret the present moment and then create like affordances for new ways of becoming. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. And so that's, you know, rather than like, you know, oh, let's, you know, let's go and, and sort of at, tear down the college structures and Irwin and undermine them. It's almost like the the act of the act of creating is in itself 
a deconstruct can be kind of a deconstructive yes. move or, or create an affordance or a clearing or something new rather than just it's like trying to balance the deconstructive tendency of destruction which does create the clearing and i like thinking about deconstructing deconstructionism you know yeah, as, a as, a, as a philosophical methodology uh, you know method of clearing but then you need something constructive right yes. and then you, you need something of a active creative reinterpretation or else you're just left in these empty effacements and, and negations yeah right? and so and i'm so sorry i will unfortunately tragically have to go in about five minutes this has been a complete joy quinn we will have <laughs> to do it again i'm sorry to to have to do that um, a few things. Um, to me, you know, where Cadell wrote like game A slash B as opposed to game B or game <laughs> right, A. Right, For right. me, well, guy, yeah. game to think about game uh, A slash B is this clearing. It's thinking in terms of clearing. Where game B might or could be too much on the side of planning. But on the flip side, we don't want to be just postmodern saying, oh, game B people are stupid and we sit around and do nothing. So Absolutely. to me, it's yep. a note. The Hegelian game B or I guess, or the game AB is something about clearing. At the same time, if we spread the internet, but people are not using the internet or creating content on it or doing work on it that points to AB thinking and creating opportunities for absolute choice, uh, then we will not, um, uh, then you won't have these communities form um, that we need, uh, the spreading of absolute knowing, the spreading of tier two and spiral dynamics, et cetera, so forth. But on the flip side, if we try to change, and I just use the, the example of energy because that's immediate. We could talk about changes in governmental structure or business structures or so on, but we'll just stick with energy. But if we say change energy today, uh, assuming Chad Haig is correct, and I think he is, um, if we change energy today without doing this work of, say, internet, plot, in, internet infrastructure and game uh, and uh, A-B thinking, if we don't do th those two things and we change the energy, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to probably have the metacrisis be um, a big issue. To take on the meta crisis, order is a big deal. The order that things are done in is is a big deal, and I think that's something we may not. Um, I I there needs to be an for me there needs to be a real emphasis on order, and the value of Hegel's um, critiques about planning the future is helping one think in terms of order, where you say okay, in order to maintain the right order to navigate the meta crisis, we have to make a clearing, not a plan. Okay, well, that does that has practical implications. That's that 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 has very big practical implications. Um, for me to break up the college monopoly, it's a different subject. But um, the Supreme Court ruled against employment testing in the se about seventy two. Um, they got rid of it because they were afraid of racism and discrimination, and indeed they were used for that. But now you just have the problem of discrimination on campus. You didn't get rid of the problem; you just moved it to you know colleges where now you have affirmative action. And the issue is. Basically, colleges just became employment tests in disguise. Uh, they became IQ tests in disguise in different things. If you brought back where you made it not so legally risky for, say, companies to just trade, say, hey, OK, you think you have what it takes to be a designer? Well, come down and show us. I don't care if you're a 40 year old single mother. Uh, if you've got what it takes because you taught yourself on YouTube, come right ahead. Um, that, to me, is an example of reversing a Supreme Court decision or complexifying it. Um, where there will, of course, be risk, but there's risk with the college system, but it's more on the side of clearing than it is planning. Because if there's a single mother who's 42 years old who is better at X job than the college graduate at 26, I would rather have the single mother at 42 come out and do it. Also, um, fixing the college monopoly on credentials will really help this kind of desert space that exists between when people turn 25 and retire. There's like the middle years is this weird <laughs> desert space where your whole life is determined by what you did up to when you were about 25. This is very inefficient and silly. And it's basically entirely a result. A lot of it is a result of the college monopoly on credentials. So to me, that is just an example in regarding thinking about employment testing in new ways um, or bringing it about. And I would have to elaborate on the argument we tried to in The Fate of Beauty um, of talking about a clearing. So to bring it to a close, because I'm last, I have to go get the children. Um, and we'll, we'll have to do this again, Quinn. I've really enjoyed this. It's been tremendous. Um, but thinking in terms of clearing and as opposed to planning and ordering the meta, the ways we address, not really solve the meta crisis, because there will always be a meta crisis, but figuring out how to address it is a really big deal. And to me, getting the order correct is really assisted by thinking in terms of cone dynamics, 
versus spiral dynamics, because that will put an emphasis on a spreading of an internet infrastructure. And if we take McClowski seriously, then we will also think about AB philosophy, of which I think we can understand better what that means when we think of the phenomenology of the creative act. And if we use that as a reference point to help um, anchor people's ideas and understanding of AB thinking, then I do think it is possible to spread that new idea to perhaps help us navigate the meta crisis of which is currently occurring um, if we set ourselves to the task in a manner that we are willing to rise to and become according to. Uh, beautiful soul, Quinn. I, think we've done it. I, think I really enjoyed speaking. We'll have to do it again, Quinn.